Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody on this nice cold snowy day if you happen to be in Colorado. I chose the theme for this presentation actually a couple weeks ago based on a suggestion from one of the members of our art asylum community and in light of the events which began on Thursday in South Boulder, Superior and Louisville out here in Colorado, perhaps it is more an example of serendipity. I think it's certainly timely. Take a moment to look at this image. It is titled Hope. We're gonna take a closer look at it a little later. Notice the liar that she is holding. Well, on April 5th, 1959, a 30-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. delivered a sermon to the congregation of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. The title of that sermon is called Shattered Dreams. Now, that doesn't have an uplifting ring to it. But the image you saw on my title slide was a significant inspiration for that sermon. Again, more about that image later. The scripture that he read for the sermon was not many that pastors preach from. He preached from Romans 15, 24, but I will also include the preceding verse 23 to give it a little context. The Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in Rome, quote, but now with no further place for me in these regions, I desire, as I have for many years, to come to you when I go to Spain. For I do hope to see you on my journey and to be sent on by you once I have enjoyed your company for a little while. Paul never realized his dream of going to Spain. He did eventually arrive in Rome, but as a prisoner, he would never know freedom again, and he was executed there. His dreams shattered, hence the title of Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon. King that day asked his congregation what their Spain was. Have you ever dreamed of going somewhere, maybe purely for pleasure or to visit family, but something intervened, say a pandemic? and forced you to postpone the journey. You really were looking forward to it, but it was not to be. Unfortunately for my son in one summer, thanks to the COVID outbreak of 2020, he had three trips canceled. One to a wildlife sanctuary, and then a rescue mission in New Mexico, one to New York City to visit the Bronx Zoo, and another to Belize on an educational trip. Your Spain might be something more significant to you personally than a trip. Did you have a grand goal you wanted to achieve? What dream have you held on to for years, maybe decades, and now are starting to fear you'll never see it fulfilled? Or maybe you've already given up on the dream, and so you are feeling something more like sadness, resentment, or despair. What dreams for your life do you still have? What dreams do you feel are now shattered? Well, despite the title to his sermon, Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon was not about disappointment or despair, but their anecdote, hope. In his sermon, King said, people tend to deal with disappointment, shattered dreams, and unfulfilled hopes in three ways. First, people often experience bitterness and resentment. This turns our heart cold and we begin to hate life itself. Martin Luther King adds, we then take our bitterness out on those closest to us, children, spouses, and our neighbor. Second, King says people deal with their shattered dreams by withdrawing emotionally, psychologically from life. They detach themselves from what is going on around them. And through such repression, King stated such people attempt to escape the disappointments of life by lifting their minds to the transcendent realm of cold indifference. A third way of dealing with shattered dreams, according to King, is fatalism. Everything is God's will, however evil it happens to be, he stated. But for King, such resignation is no solution. It again leads people away from transformative action to passive surrender. It leads people away from transformative action 
to passive surrender can conclude stating, on the one hand, we must accept the finite disappointment, but in spite of this, we must maintain the infinite hope. This is the only way that we will be able to live without the fatigue of bitterness and the drain of resentment. Martin Luther King Jr. couldn't afford fatigue in his mission, for he not only preached hope to people who were feeling deep-seated hopelessness, but he embodied hope in the way he lived, through his actions. He displayed that lived hope by organizing demonstration after demonstration of peaceful resistance, despite abuse and the lack of it bearing any fruit for years. These so that toward the end of his life, he could deliver with powerful conviction his I have a dream speech. Now, some of you are familiar with that speech, and you may recall that toward the end of it, really a sermon, actually, more than a speech, he prophesied, I may not get to the promised land with you, which was equality. I may not get to the promised land with you. King did not let the knowledge he may die before seeing his Spain, his dream fulfilled, lessen the power of hope that he expressed in his life. We need such reminders of hope, and, the need, and we need them all the time, because hope is the cure, the cure for so much of what ails us. We need hope when we're feeling intense despair or physical pain. We need hope when we feel the blues or major disappointment. At such moments, maybe paintings like this can serve us well, like it did for Martin Luther King Jr. Towards the very beginning of his sermon, he mentions this painting specifically as an inspiration for him. The lyre that this personification of hope holds only has one string. All the others are broken. But for King, this one string is all that is needed to keep hope alive, to sustain him and the people he served on the long journey ahead. For one string is still able to create a sound. Do you have a string left on your lyre to keep your dream alive? Here is an early treatment of the subject by English artist Thomas Lawrence, both of the traditional symbols. Since antiquity, hope is usually personified as a young woman, often holding a flower of some kind, and in this work, she holds an olive branch. She is flanked either side by two cherubs, reminding us that there are other powers at work in the universe to bring about peace and goodwill, to bring fulfillment of our dream. Hope is looking directly at us with a smile. And then the glorious light behind the cherub on the left, see that? There must always be some light we can look to. What do you think of this version of hope? Does it appeal to you? Well, besides using a woman to personify hope, Watts deliberately created ambiguity in this painting by using symbols not typically associated with hope. And one that immediately jumps out to me is that hope is blindfolded. Now, usually in these classic paintings, a blindfolded woman is usually the personification of love, not hope. So what might Watts be communicating to us? I'm gonna take a guess that even though we can't see a solution, a remedy to our situation, that hope remains the best source to sustain us nonetheless? What are your thoughts? And then there is the blank background, save for one tiny, tiny star. See it at the top middle of the painting? Is that really enough light for us to feel hope? Contrasted with the painting of Thomas Lawrence. Is that enough light? Well, for Watts, it was. But for some of Watts' critics, they thought a better name for this painting would be despair. But Watts replied that, 
quote, hope need not mean expectancy. It suggests here rather the music which can come from the remaining chord. It looks like hope is straining to hear the small sound that one string makes. But somehow that tiny sound is enough, Watt seems to be telling us. Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon taught us that hope, no matter how minuscule it may be in our life, is the anecdote for many negative emotions, including bitterness and resentment, which of course his black and openly oppressed at the time congregation must have certainly felt. King also saw hope as the antidote to psychological withdrawal and suppression of negative emotions. No doubt in order for the members of his congregation to make it in a white dominated Montgomery, Alabama in the 50s, they had to suppress a lot of negative emotion. But as we know, such suppression festers. It eats away at our soul. We need the better solution of hope. Well, beyond King's sermon, I'd like to look at some other reasons we need hope. We need hope after experiencing a tragedy like the wildfires we just experienced here in Colorado. I'm sure many of us were both captivated and horrified by the images of vast swaths of fire on our television screens or computer monitors. And I'm fully aware that for some, tears are still flowing over the devastating loss. But ironically, images of fire can also be a symbol of hope. For those who lost their homes, there are powerful reminders in nature and art, such as the powerful symbol of a rising sun. This work also by Watts expresses in its own profound way the idea of hope. After a great flood, a natural disaster, perhaps of biblical proportions, we need a sign of hope. And what greater sign than that of the rising and blinding fire of the sun? The sun will indeed come out tomorrow, as the song goes. J.M.W. Turner, that great English romantic painter, also treated this subject with a sun. An almost blinding cosmic swirl of fire and light in which revelation comes to Moses and revelation is offered to us. Turner's son seems to symbolize the ever-present aid of higher spiritual powers available to us. The sun will indeed come out tomorrow, but it's also ever-present whenever we call upon it. We know it, and yet need images like this to remind us of it constantly. Then there is a kind of hope we need during these present times of hateful and spiteful tribalism. There is cancel culture coming from the left and there's Trumpism coming from the right. And those of us between the extremes are its victims. We may be feeling despair for the fate of unity in our country. Do we still recognize our common humanity? The media tends to minimize sensible voices. The more radical and extreme the political rhetoric is, the more media coverage it receives. And so it's difficult to tune this tribalism out since whenever we turn on our TV or visit some websites, it confronts us. At such times, I look to art such as this. I have hope in our collective intelligence and moral vision. For those of us who find hope in ideas, we look to the symbols of great civilizations who birthed the greatest minds, like this Acropolis. Finally, there is a kind of hope we need when facing an existential crisis, like our own mortality. Now, I know some say public speaking is our greatest fear, but our own death is right there with it. In fact, it is the fear of death, I believe, that causes most of our pain and suffering in life. Some of us may find comfort in images such as this by Georgia O'Keeffe. When we are facing the oppressive fact of death, we need the soothing that such tones of white and blue offer us. And we may also find comfort knowing we will soon be absorbed into something much greater, a drop of water returning to a great ocean, absorbed into a blissful peace. 
Or perhaps we need an image more like this one from Gustave Doré, one that might remind us of comforting beliefs of a real afterlife. For those who feel such images are based more in superstitious and wishful thinking, there is the fact that art like this actually corresponds quite well to the descriptions of near-death experiences, or NDEs for short. So this image is not completely fanciful, but expresses real experiences people have had. This image of paradise by Gustave Doré, inspired by Dante's Divine Comedy, fits the common experience of NDEers of a spiral or tunnel with a glorious light at the end. Often people who have such experiences say they had a spirit guide and that they saw other angelic-like entities or deceased, deceased loved ones. There are actual scientists, scientists who study these matters. I recently read this book by Bruce Grayson. Now, some of you may be familiar with that name if you've been with me for a while since I mentioned him in a previous presentation, but I think that was a couple of years back. Let me tell you a story about Bruce. 50 years ago, a young Grayson was the psychiatric intern at a hospital in Virginia. He was called on his pager to meet with the roommate of a young woman named Holly, who had tried to commit suicide by overdose. Holly was in the emergency room, still unconscious. Instead of first visiting Holly's roommate, he wanted to get an update on the patient. He saw that Holly was stable, but had yet to regain consciousness. He went out and found Susan, the roommate who had brought Holly to the hospital, and took her to the family lounge at the far end of the hallway away from Holly's room. He had a lengthy conversation with Susan, gathering all the details about the events leading up to Holly's hospitalization and about how Susan was faring. At one point, he unbuttoned his lab coat, revealing his tie, which had a spaghetti sauce stain on it. This is an important detail. Susan then went home and Grayson checked back on the patient. Holly was still unconscious and hadn't stirred once, according to the sitter assigned to Holly's room. It was late, and so he left the hospital, but returned early the next morning to check on Holly. She had just woken up when he arrived, and so Grayson went to speak with her. What Holly discussed with him shocked him. Holly told him she remembered seeing him the previous evening, but not when he entered her room, which she apparently was, when she was apparently still unconscious. She told Grayson she actually remembered him from speaking with her roommate, Susan. How could Holly know Grayson had spoken to Susan? They were on the other side of the corridor in a different room. Grayson asked if the staff had told her he'd met with Susan. She said no, that she had seen Grayson speaking with Susan in the family lounge, an impossibility, of course, based on where Holly's room was. Holly then described in perfect detail and accuracy the whole content of Grayson's conversation with Susan, including her seeing the stain on Grayson's tie. Grayson couldn't believe what he was hearing. And he later confirmed that there had been no contact with Susan after Holly confirmed that there had been no, that Holly had woken up, excuse me. He confirmed that there had been no contact with Susan after Holly had woken up. In fact, Holly only woke up right as Grayson arrived that morning at the hospital. And Grayson had no explanation for this. He was a committed scientific materialist at this point. He was not religious in any way. The mind was the brain, in his view. So this very odd perplexing moment in Grayson's professional life was the seed that led him to become one of the directors of the Department of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia. What does a Department of Perceptual Studies actually investigate? Near-death experiences and the possibility, the possibility, of our having an aspect, most likely what we call our consciousness, that is separate from our physical body. Now, I've been following Grayson's work, and as some of you know, I've been doing it for several years now. In his book, After, he summarizes his experience over four decades examining with scientific rigor near-death experiences. He also offers plenty of examples in this book, some truly hard to believe. I'm going to tell you one of them right now. Jack Bybee, I think he's a South African, was hospitalized with severe pneumonia. 
He had been flirting with his young and pretty nurse, Anita, who told him it was her 21st birthday and her parents were arriving later that day. Well, after Anita left, Jack's condition worsened and he had a near-death experience. And in his NDE, he met Anita, quote, on the other side, as he put it. What are you doing here, he asked her. Anita told him he had to go back and tell her parents how sorry she was that she had crashed the brand new red MGB they had bought her as a birthday present. She also asked him to tell them she loved them. Now, when Jack regained consciousness, he mentioned to the attending nurse who happened to be Anita's best friend what he had experienced, and she ran out of the ward sobbing. What Jack discovered later was that Anita had been surprised by the gift of the car and had immediately taken it out for a fast ride. She smashed into a concrete telephone pole and died instantly. Now, many people who have NDEs mentioned they saw deceased relatives or friends. These are people they already knew had died. But to see someone you didn't know was dead and to describe other information like the brand new red MGB that someone couldn't possibly know about is a whole other matter. Thousands of cases like this have led Grayson to the following conclusion despite his traditional scientific training. He said in that book, the idea that our minds, our thoughts, feelings, hopes, fears are produced solely by our physical brains is not is not a scientific fact. It is a philosophical theory proposed to explain scientific facts. Here's another strange observation Grayson has made over 40 years of studying NDEers. Universally, those who have a near-death experience say they lost all fear of death. Now you would think the loss of the fear of death with that, they might live the remaining years in this world on cruise control. You know, ride out this life as comfortably as possible. Just seek momentary comfort and pleasure since it's all going to be all right when we pass from this life to the next. So no real austere moral requirements, no religious dogmatic affirmations are needed. But what happens often happens to indie ears is that they radically change their life from one of self-interest to one of service to others. And unlike with typical spiritual or psychedelic experiences, these changes last the rest of their lives. The rest of their lives, gone are materialistic concerns. Indie ears will often change their occupation to one more overtly in service to others, such as social work or the healing and therapeutic industries. The still non-religious Grayson also concludes from all these cases, a common religious truism. Because we are loved, we should love others. Some of you listening may still not be able to accept the idea of life after death and believe Grayson's subjects were all hallucinating or something. Even so, if that's the case, you can still conclude from the evidence of NDEs that we will leave the physical world experiencing an indescribable peace and bliss, that death really has lost its sting. And that's pretty hopeful news for all of us. Friends, we need hope at every stage of life. We need it after some horrible tragedy. We need it when in the deepest pit of despair, we need it when our dreams seem shattered. We need it when facing death. At such times, where will you look to find a blessed hope? What is the one string left on your lyre? 